We might be a small island, but we've got a big history. Everywhere you stand, there are worlds beneath your feet. And so every year, hundreds of archaeologists across Britain go looking for more clues. Who lived here, when and how? You can even see the architecture of the bone inside the jaw there. Archaeology is a complex jigsaw puzzle, drawing together everything from skeletons to swords, temples to treasure. She's got a very cartoon-like face, hasn't she? Uh -huh. From Orkney to Devon, we're joining this year's quest on sea, land and air. We'll share all of the questions and find some of the answers as we join the teams in the field digging for Britain. The Anglo-Saxons invaded and divided our island and ushered in the Dark Ages. This year, archaeology is offering fresh clues about the people who gave us England, the land of the Angles. Their warrior culture of swords and ornate burials. The physical evidence of violence in a time of blood feuds. And this is sliced down the entire left side of his body and the mystery of the magnificent ring once worn by a wealthy Anglo-Saxon and never seen publicly until now. For almost 400 years, Britannia was a part of the Roman Empire, controlled by Rome's legions and strategically positioned forts. But by 410 AD, the troops had withdrawn and raiders began to plunder the wealthy and defenceless land. In the dying years of the Roman Empire, the Emperor Honorius received pleas from the British people. But with barbarians to deal with on the home front and the empire on the brink of collapse, he couldn't afford to send reinforcements. The people of Britain would have to look to their own defence. The islands ceased to be part of a coherent empire and the legacies of Rome were left to crumble. Crucially, written records all but disappeared, ushering in the so-called Dark Ages. Britain was left wide open to bands of invaders from the continent. They included powerful tribes from France, Germany and Scandinavia, who we've come to know collectively as the Anglo-Saxons, and it wasn't long before they started to feel comfortable in their new home. The departure of the Romans and the arrival of the first Germanic settlers is a shady period, recorded by just a sparse collection of texts. And even the archaeology that connects us to the people who lived through this period is scarce. Dorchester on Thames has thrown up some of the most important finds. And a new dig is hoping to add to the best evidence we have for this transition, a handful of artefacts that emerged from the fields around Dorchester over a hundred years ago. They're stored here at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. The objects I'm about to see were found in the 19th century, but the fact that they are perhaps the best archaeological evidence we have of the earliest Anglo-Saxons in Britain gives us an idea of just how rare those physical traces of the early post-Roman period are. These artefacts came out of the graves of three people buried in the 5th century. One is a burial which seems to be Roman, until you look more closely. He was buried wearing a late Roman belt, known as a cingulum. It's, it's really a badge of rank, of status. And this would have been made in Gaul, in an imperial workshop. But the chap wearing it, of course, we know, lived and died in Britain. Now, you might just think, well, why 
couldn't he just have been a Roman soldier? And this is certainly a, a, a badge of, of high rank in, in, in the Roman military. But it would be very unusual for a Roman soldier to be buried with his cingulum, with his belt. That, that's quite a Germanic style of burying your dead. So he's got Roman objects, but he's buried in an un-Roman way with grave goods. Absolutely. Next to him, a woman's grave contained further evidence of this mixing of Roman and Saxon identities, a Roman belt buckle alongside two early Saxon brooches. This is a so-called little cruciform brooch, and the other um, is the back plate of what's called an applied brooch. And that proves that she was not only wearing dress items from Germanic parts of the world, but that she was wearing a costume which is really Germanic. So she's got a mixture of both Roman and Germanic style about her. Absolutely. And the fact that she was buried next to or near to this chap and that he was buried in a rather Germanic way, albeit with Roman items, suggests very strongly that these two were Germanic speakers from the other side of the North Sea. Another grave added confirmation that these people were keen to signify themselves as both Roman and Saxon. The question of what was happening to identities and how these were being reinvented and reformulated to meet these rapidly changing and you know, rather traumatic circumstances is extremely interesting. And it's incredibly difficult and rare to find objects that can be firmly and definitively dated to the first half of the fifth century. I mean, whether Roman or Saxon, they're both rare. And these burials are some of the best evidence for, for how people were negotiating this very tricky period. Connecting with the Dark Ages, even through archaeology, is a real challenge. The artefacts from those graves scattered around Dorchester are fascinating. They date to this time of incredibly dramatic change in Britain. But they are just a handful of objects from a very small number of graves. We're not looking at a whole cemetery, let alone a settlement. So we are just glimpsing a very tiny part of the whole story. At this year's dig amongst the garden allotments of Dorchester, archaeologists are hoping to add substance to our hazy picture of this time of upheaval. They're not just looking for artefacts, but for structures and features too, and in situ in their original context. Clues to make sense of two overlapping ways of life. We tend to think of multicultural Britain being a modern phenomenon, but as we look back through history, we see a nation transformed by successive waves of people and ideas, and we neatly compartmentalise those cultures. But just how abrupt were the transitions? Roman Britain didn't become Anglo-Saxon overnight. It must have been more of a gradual process, a blending of two cultures. And archaeology allows us to examine the lives of people living through that transition. You've probably heard of the Venerable Bede. He was an 8th century Northumbrian monk and the most famous chronicler of his age. His ecclesiastical history of the English people is still our best source for the arrival of the Anglo-Saxons, but we do have to treat what he writes with a little caution. He wasn't out to write an unbiased account, and it's strongly motivated by his Christian faith. Bede tells us that Northumbria was conquered and settled by the Angles. The commanding site of Bambra became the power base of this emerging tribal kingdom. The castle we see today was largely rebuilt in the 20th century, but we know from archaeology that the site has been occupied for 5,000 years, going right back into the Neolithic. The castle sits on this massive rock, which is the strongest natural fortress on the coast of northeast England, and with commanding views over land and sea, Bambra would become the seat of the Northumbrian kings. But even at a royal site like Bambra, 
We have to work hard to decipher the clues left behind by the Anglo-Saxon people who lived here. So what have we got over here then, Graham? Uh, well, I mean, that's the one fortunate thing, that it's now exposed again so we can have a look at it. Director of archaeology Graham Young outlined where a Saxon timber hall would once have stood. The people who lived here constructed their buildings out of wood which has long since disappeared, leaving just an impression of the early fortress. So this really is negative archaeology, isn't it? You've just got the holes left where the timbers of this wooden building have, have just rotted. Yes, we're, we're, we've got enough evidence that we can reconstruct broadly what's above ground. And we're standing right inside it and right on the edge of the rock here. So, so what would this building have been? Uh, well, we think it's, it's to do with the gate because the Anglo-Saxon entrance to, to Bamber is just behind us. It's this cleft here. Uh, there's a marvellous little text from AD 774 and it describes this, these steps coming up through a cleft in a marvellous fashion, as the author says, and that must be it. There's nothing else at Bamber that, that fits the bill. So we're standing in the middle Anglo-Saxon gatehouse to Bamber Castle. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. We know that generations of Anglo-Saxons lived and worked at Bambra over a prolonged period stretching hundreds of years. And yet even here, the footprints of the people are faint and hard to trace. Much of what we do know comes from sources like Bede, but what they tend to focus on is the high-status individuals, the kings and queens. But there are people who made much less of an impression on Bede people whose archaeological signature is much more difficult to trace. There's not much evidence of their buildings and certainly no buried treasure or magnificent graves. These are the ordinary people, the farmers and workers who populated the rural landscape. And they are even harder to find. This is rural Northumberland, and we're right in the heart of Bede's home territory. Today, we exploit this landscape for its natural resources of sand and gravel. But the same industrial machinery used to remove this material has uncovered rare and vital evidence of life in the so-called Dark Ages. Dr Clive Waddington is leading the excavations at Lantern Quarry. Last year, his team unearthed rare traces of an ordinary early Anglo-Saxon village. In front of me here, we've got a range of the finds that we got from the excavations at Lanton. So you can see, for example, this large stone here, which is a local sandstone. To the untrained eye, it might not look like a lot, but when you turn it over, you can see this lovely, smoothed, flat face. And that's got this perforation here in the centre, and this is a base of what we call a quern stone, which is a rubbing stone, um, which would have had a rotary quern on, on the top, another stone, um, that would have been used for milling grain to create flour. Fragments of evidence reveal that the daily lives of these long-forgotten villages would have involved milling, weaving and metalworking. But there are also more decorative items we found some glass beads, and you can see that these are really beautifully decorated, and we call them polychrome beads, they're multicoloured. These have been analysed and have been shown to contain traces of metal as well, where, which they'd used to colour the glass. It's not treasure, but these everyday objects are shedding light on the workers, farmers and craftsmen who settled these rural plains. Three hundred miles down the coast, I'm about to meet the founding fathers of the invasion. According to Bede, the Anglo-Saxon takeover began here on the coast of Kent with the arrival of two warrior brothers, Hengist and Horsa. They had been called in to help the British King Vortigern fight against his enemies, the Picts, and they were followed by wave upon wave of Germanic warriors who settled in Kent. But before long, those incomers would turn against their host and start to expand the boundaries of their new territory. We don't know 
know whether these two men actually existed, but it is clear that Germanic tribes were settling in Kent by the 5th century. We're in what may have been the territory of the first Anglo-Saxon warlords to settle here. Within a hundred years of their arrival, their kingdom became the richest and most powerful in Britain. And this year, the skeletons of the people who lived here at this time have been emerging from the ground. A huge new highway is being built in Thanet, cutting straight through an area that's particularly rich in archaeology. A team from Oxford Wessex Archaeology has been called in to systematically excavate the area before the road can be laid. There's a male individual, you can see by the very prominent eyebrow ridges, the very, very robust clavicles or collarbones. As well as Saxon graves, archaeologists have found pits full of discarded shells, evidence of the food eaten by local settlers. They record their findings using satellite technology, eventually linking together all the graves and finds across the site. When the work is finished, all the information they've discovered here will form a detailed computerised map. This excavation is absolutely massive, but it's just one of over 20 similar sites up and down the road scheme. Here, we've got the two largest archaeological units in the UK coming together. There are over 100 professional archaeologists on site at any one time, making it the largest excavation in Britain this year. And when they've finished, it will all disappear once more beneath the tarmac and cars that will eventually pass this way. But the archaeologists' work will continue. Analysis will be carried out on the skeletons. Eventually, we should know their age, their sex, and even the diseases they suffered from. It may take years, but archaeology isn't just about the digging. In 2008, another Anglo-Saxon cemetery was discovered 30 miles away, and it's only now, after nearly two years of research, that it's yielding remarkable insights into their world. You might wonder what I'm doing in a car park outside a shopping centre in Sittingbourne, but I promise you, if you come with me through these doors, there's evidence of Anglo-Saxon Kent at the height of its powers. Archaeologists have recovered 2,500 objects from around 230 graves at a site called The Meads. It's an enormous collection of clues dating back nearly 1,500 years. And processing this volume of material demands a unique approach. Right, I think this must be it. Dana Goodburn Brown is an archaeological conservator. A year ago, she pioneered a radical new scheme, encouraging local volunteers to get involved with conserving the grave goods of people who may have been their ancestors. So have you got people coming in who've, who've never done anything like this before? Oh yeah, no, most of, no one's done anything exactly like this. No, they go through a training session and we have some practice pieces and then they start working on the real thing. So what are the artefacts that you're working on here, Dana? Well, this is a side view of this block, which seems to have this enormous um, brooch that's gilded. You can just see a little bit of gilt, gilt and gold coming out, so there's quite an intricate design going on there. But they could see that there was a series of rings. Now, if they lifted them out individually, you'd kind of just have a series of rings and you wouldn't really know what it was. Mm. But if you x-ray it as a block, you can see the relationship yeah. between one yeah. and the other. So that's the, these, uh, this was something that went around the waist and probably keys or things might have hang, hung off of it. Dana's innovative project is opening up archaeology to everyone and is already proving popular. We've had almost 10,000 people, and um, so you get people just dropping by. Some people come back and again and again, and um, we've been open for several months, and people are still just discovering us new. Yeah. Don't you think it's great? Because the, loads of people can see it. Normally, conservation work goes on behind closed doors in a museum, and, and, and 
I love what I do and it's really nice to share it with other people. I do have to stop myself sometimes and think, oh, this is 1400 years old and, and, and some craftsman you know, made this and then someone wore it, it's quite special, yeah. This is such a great example of community engagement. Anybody in this shopping mall, or they might be coming here to get their weekly shop or for a cup of tea, can pop in here and find out more about conservation, archaeology and local history. And if they're really interested, they can also volunteer. But right now, I want to find out more about the artefacts from those graves. Once they've been cleaned, you get a sense of the incredible craftsmanship that's gone into making these stunning objects. But what can they tell us about Anglo-Saxon life? Dr Andrew Richardson of the Canterbury Archaeological Trust has been interpreting these finds for over two years. Andrew, these are wonderful objects just here. Are they brooches? Yes. I mean, if you, if you look at this one, this is what we call a plated disc brooch. It's basically a silver back plate mm. with a gold front plate, then gold cell work, and then inlaid with, with garnets and very, very fine gold filigree wire. It's also very delicately made. It is. It's, it is, it's very highly skilled uh, craft working. And you know, when you show this sort of thing to modern jewellers, uh, they say that they would, they would have to charge you an enormous amount of money to make a, really? a, a, a copy of this. The woman who owned this, who wore this, would probably be, have been at the top of the social scale in, right. in, this, in this community. Incredibly high status, possibly even royal connections. Definitely, yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. Many of the people buried here by their grieving loved ones were adorned with magnificent pieces of jewellery. But the whole community is here, some buried with ordinary everyday items, like this iron knife. If you think about you know, the full range of objects we've got from this site, it's a huge investment in wealth in the ground. And it isn't recovered by them. It's only when we excavate it that, that it emerges uh, into the light again. The people interred here were part of a wave of settlers who'd come to make their mark. And nearly 1,500 years on, this cemetery is allowing us to glimpse how their society functioned. A member of a powerful family dies, they, the family have to sort of reaffirm that that family still has power and status. Because this certainly isn't costume jewellery, is it? I mean, this is the real thing. These are, these are incredibly prized items. This, this is the real thing. I mean, for their time, these are the top of the range um, jewellery that Anglo-Saxon England can produce. We can suppose that these settlers were seen by the people already living here as invaders, and power in these times was wielded at the end of a sword. The cemetery bears witness to the importance of these weapons. These are iron weapons. You've got spearheads. Uh, some of these spearheads inlaid with, with gold. You've got um, some decorated pyramid mounts from a sword belt. They are amazing. Can I pick that up on yes, its yes. face? Yes. These exquisite items are over a 1,000 years old shaped in silver, inlaid with gold and topped with garnet. An extraordinary amount of effort has gone into crafting them. I think they're real um, functional weapons, but they have a symbolic role. Um, young children, uh, people who are, are severely disabled have been found buried with weapons, people who could never have used them in battle. But, but still see themselves sometimes see them as warriors. So they do, they do. And I think, you know, Anglo-Saxon, culture, if you look at their poetry, uh, their artwork, is very, very um, centred on warfare. It's about communicating a message about how they see themselves, how their families see the deceased in the funeral rite. This amazing cemetery has let me back into a long vanished world of Anglo-Saxon warlords and their much loved wives and daughters. But the finds reveal that this was a world not just of warfare, but of feasting too. What about these vessels here in the centre? They're rather intriguing. Well, these are replicas of two cut glass cone beakers that were excavated in one of the graves at this site. They actually were found intact. They're quite curious. You obviously couldn't stand that up no. on the table. And I think, I think these are, again, about communal feasting. I think these would be passed around the mead table. Um, 
and these were found together in a, in a, in a grave of, a, of a, somebody with a sword, so perhaps a warrior, but certainly a man, um, and are making a statement about perhaps his love of feasting, his love of mead. Uh, and it's, it's ironic that, you know, the site is called the Meads and um, they built a pub on it. There is so little documentary evidence of early Anglo-Saxon society, so cemeteries like this and those amazing grave goods offer us a really precious insight into that culture. And we start to be able to really focus on those people in the forgotten cemetery who themselves have long since faded from memory. The idea of a Christian god was slowly gaining ground, but the pagan gods and goddesses were so deeply rooted in Anglo-Saxon culture that they wouldn't disappear overnight. Christianity had returned, and like the invaders' own arrival, it would wash through the land, slowly but surely. One important aspect of this change is that by the 8th century, hundreds of minsters and nunneries had taken root all over Anglo-Saxon Britain. The presence of these monastic communities moulded the entire future of the country, not least because they reintroduced widespread literacy. But apart from inside the very greatest of these religious houses, we have very little idea of what life was like in them. And that's what makes our next story so exciting. It's a rare opportunity to excavate and understand an Anglo-Saxon nunnery. This is Barclay Castle in modern-day Gloucestershire. Some of the castle dates to the 12th century, but its roots go back to the Christian conversion of the Anglo-Saxons. 17th century manuscripts speak of an Anglo-Saxon nunnery based within these grounds. And my friends from Bristol University are hoping to find its walls. Looking good, guys. Looking good. I've no Dr Stuart Pryor is co-directing the excavations. He's been able to put a date on some of the early structures that are emerging. Just from this area here, we got this absolutely fantastic Anglo-Saxon strap end. Um, would have been on the end of a belt. And essentially, it's, uh, it's in the shape of a little beast's head, a little dragon's head, and it's 9th century. And this was buried underneath the section of collapse wall. So what that shows is that this building, just here behind me, has to be 8th or early 9th century, goes out of use. Part of the wall collapses and seals this particular object. And essentially what this does is it gives us really good dated evidence to say this is Saxon and it's probably the nunnery. Go up to there, 20 metres long. There. Also directing the dig is Professor Mark Horton. He's finding some intriguing evidence of life inside the Anglo-Saxon nunnery. The thing about Anglo-Saxon archaeology is that finds are incredibly rare, but we've been really lucky in, in finding an extraordinary quantity of material from this excavation, metalwork like buckles and so forth. But maybe the most interesting are these three. This is a whetstone or a honestone. It probably would have hung around somebody's neck. And what it was used for was sharpening the knife that you would then sharpen the quill which you would use for illuminating manuscripts, parchment manuscripts. So it's evidence of learning, of scholarship, um, literacy in the Middle Saxon period. This find might be tiny, but it's a rare piece of physical evidence from a world in flux, a direct link to the revival of the written word throughout Anglo-Saxon Britain. And this is an extraordinary piece. It's 8th century. Experts are really divided on what it really is, but I think it's what's called an astal. It would have had a bone pointer attached to one end. It would have been used to help reading manuscripts. We know that these religious houses were not just places of worship, and as the digging continues, artefacts are gradually emerging from the ground, 
that reveal that they were also focal points for commercial activity. This was only found yesterday, just up there on that surface up there. And it is the earliest type of coinage used in Anglo-Saxon England. Dates from around 690 to around 740, is known as a skeet. Now, these things are very, very rare in Western Britain. They're found in some quantities in places like London and Ipswich and Southampton. But here in the West, they're virtually unheard of. And why it's so exciting, it tells us two things. One is that this place was a really tr important for trade and commerce. And the second reason is that this find puts the site back much earlier. The first documentary evidence we've got is in the middle part of the eighth century. This coin suggests that people here in the late seventh or early eighth century, right at the beginning of the conversion of this part of the world to Christianity. The jewel in the crown of this Anglo-Saxon nunnery is a quite incredible object. No one seems to know exactly where it was found or how. And as far as I know, it's never been seen by the public before. So it's incredibly exciting that we're getting a chance to examine it. That is fantastic, isn't it? Absolutely fantastic. It's actually bigger than, than I imagined. It's a, yeah, it's, it's yeah. an extraordinary thing. You, you know, you've seen photographs or drawings, but when you see the thing itself, it is a wonderful, wonderful piece. Leslie Webster, former curator of Anglo-Saxon archaeology at the British Museum, is astonished by the level of its artistry. The craftsmanship, which is magnificent, um, and the sort of sheer quantity of gold that's gone into that. So the question I've got to ask you, Leslie, how old is it? Well, looking at the style of the piece, my feeling is that it belongs to the first third of the ninth century. That's amazing. Although we can't say for sure that the ring is Christian, it seems to be in the shape of a cross. Leslie suspects that it was worn by someone of very high status, but whether a bishop or a king, we just don't know. The other question I really need to ask, obviously, is how, how do you think it was made? Well, if I can oh, seize it from okay. you and get a closer look, it is absolutely superb. I mean, what we've got are four little animal creatures with uh, pointy ears, long snouts, we've got little staring eyes, so it does look quite wolf-like, I mm. think, or hound-like. Now, the filigree is also wonderful. It's so fine, and this lovely plaited work round the outside here, very, very delicate. Uh, again, that's quite an early-ish feature. The craftsmanship is just magnificent. I can't believe yeah. that it survived mm. in such amazing condition. It's a very imposing monumental ring, and, and in in its whole character and style, it is unique. Perhaps what's most interesting about this process of the re-Christianisation of Britain is that it's not one neat linear story. Various missionaries arrived at different times from overseas, preaching the religions of the Celtic and Roman churches and attempting the conversion of the pagan Anglo-Saxon kings. According to Bede, the Northumbrian king Oswald brought Christianity to his people. He called for a missionary to come from the Irish monastery on the island of Iona to convert his people. And when the monk Aidan arrived, Oswald granted him land to build a monastery on Lindisfarne over there. And the island became a cradle of Christianity. This was the golden age of Northumbria. The royal capital of Bamburgh would have been a magnet for people from across the kingdom, perhaps from across the world, who came here seeking fame, glory and gainful employment. Twelve years ago, archaeologists located an extensive burial ground right next to the castle. Buried beneath the sand dunes were the remains of the residents of the Anglo-Saxon fortress of Bamburgh. One hundred skeletons were removed, just a portion of the total number believed to be buried there and taken to Durham University for extensive analysis and research. 
I'm an osteologist, someone who studies human bones, so I know how much these physical remains can reveal about the lives of past people. Archaeologists can tell a certain amount about ancient lifestyles by looking at objects that people have left behind. But long after we die, our bones hold an enormous amount of information about us. Dr Sarah Groves was involved in the excavations at Bambra as a student and has been analysing the skeletons ever since. Her findings, due to be published next year, reveal some fascinating observations about the community living there. The vast majority of the population did have quite bad teeth. Um, almost every individual, adults and children alike, had calculus on some of their teeth at least. And a really high proportion of them had caries as well, so that's uh, tooth decay like this individual over here. That hole's massive. It's uh, taken away almost the entire top of the root there, just hanging onto the crane. And the tooth next to it's completely gone. All we've got left is the roots remaining there. Yeah. We all know the pain of toothache, and these people didn't have modern drugs or dentists to ease their pain. So why do you think there were such high rates of tooth decay and gum disease in this population? Well, it's got to be something to do with the diet that they're eating because it's affecting the whole population, so they must be eating something in their diet which is making them more prone to having these, these dent dental diseases. And what could that be? Well, I think that they must be eating quite a lot of meat and we're seeing that from the archaeological material, and also eating a lot of flour, which is quite starchy and leads to sugars building up in the mouth. And also things like beer and wine and mead, all of which are quite sugary. And if you're drinking a lot of drinks like that, then that can also lead to tooth decay. So rather bizarrely, these atrocious teeth are telling us that these people had quite a luxurious lifestyle. Potentially, yeah. And very rarely, the stories told by individual skeletons contain clues about the way these people interacted with each other. So is this a, is this a young person, a juvenile? It's a young person, but I don't think it's really a juvenile. If you look at the state of fusion, it could be an individual who's between 10 and 16 years. So looking here, the end of the radius in the forearm, that's, that's still completely separate, and the ends of these finger bones as well are still separate. But if you come up here and look at the teeth, you can see that actually they've got quite an adult dentition. Do these teeth really belong with this skeleton? They do, and if I hadn't been there during the excavation, I would have asked some questions about whether the, the skull did belong with the body, but it really does. So we're looking at somebody who, from their teeth, it looks as though they're in their late teens, early 20s. Yeah. But from the rest of their bones, it looks as though they're a child still. Yeah. A picture was emerging of a seriously disabled young man whose skeleton was ravaged by a debilitating condition. And if you go right down there to the knee, you can see this right knee is really abnormal. That's very odd. If I pick up the left knee as well for comparison, it just looks odd, doesn't it? It's very flared. The knee joint is so malformed that it probably would have caused the problems with walking. So this person had a congenital problem they're, they're very short, um, they probably look slightly deformed as well, but they're being buried in this high status cemetery. Yeah, and you can imagine that this is somebody who's potentially had to be cared for throughout their life, and yet they've still managed to reach early adulthood. So it suggests that as the population, their family, their friends are looking out for them, they're looking after them and affording them all the dignity and burial that everybody else in the cemetery was given. So it really shows you that this is a community so much like us now, we, you know, caring for our sick, for our young people, for our elderly and, and for people with disabilities. What's emerging is a different picture than we might expect of these so-called barbarians. We're starting to see them as people like us, members of families with friends and loved ones. And this isn't just the perspective that we're getting at Bambra. 300 miles away to the southwest, Mark Horton has been researching a wonderful story of Anglo-Saxon royalty and a Wessex princess in love. Inside Malmesbury Abbey in Wiltshire is a tomb dedicated to the first king of all England, Athelstan. Athelstan, remarkably for his period, was not just 
somebody who wanted to expand the, the frontiers of the Anglo-Saxon kingdom, but also wanted to create alliances with Europe. And he systematically married off his sisters to all sorts of European rulers and princes and dukes. The most successful alliance was between his sister Edith and Otto of Germany. Not only was this a politically astute move, but it also proved to be a great love affair. Edith captured the imagination not only of Otto, but also his court and the people around her, because she was clearly stunningly beautiful. Um, we know that, 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 that Otto was very much devoted to her. He gave Magdeburg as a dowry, this, 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 this town on the frontier, where she ended up being buried and where Otto himself ended up being buried later on. During recent excavations in Magdeburg Cathedral in Germany, archaeologists set about exploring a 16th century sarcophagus dedicated to Edith. It was thought to be a cenotaph, it was thought to be an empty tomb, but actually inside was found a lead casket. Um, and in that was an inscription that said, these are the remains of Queen Edith that were placed here in the year 1510. But in the Middle Ages, people constantly move bones around. Relics was big business. So we really had to be certain that the bones were those of Edith and not some random person that had been scooped up in order to give this, this tomb some sort of credibility. If these were her remains, it would be an extremely significant find, providing a direct link to the first king of England, Athelstan and only science can help us determine whose body this is. Two of the teeth found within the coffin were sent off to be analysed at Bristol University. Dr Alastair Pike planned to measure strontium isotopes in the teeth to find out where this individual grew up. Strontium is found in soil and absorbed by plants and animals it finds its way into the bones and teeth of the people who eat them. Because teeth form during childhood, the strontium found in dental enamel reflects where a person was born and raised. And in Edith's case, this would have been in Wessex, the royal kingdom at the heart of an emerging England. As far as Alastair is concerned, the results from the Magdeburg tomb are conclusive. I think that we can be 99% certain that we have the remains of Princess Edith, partly because the archaeological evidence suggests she's of the correct age, but using the strontium isotopes, we can show that the, the results are consistent with someone who's been brought up uh, on the kind of geology that surrounds the Winchester area, which is what the historical accounts suggest Princess Edith did. Although Edith died over a thousand years ago, she remains proof of our timeless fascination with princesses. She came back to England in a way that in her lifetime she would never have expected to do. And she was an exceptional lady and somebody who really is at the fountainhead of sort of modern Europe, whose blood probably runs in the veins of most royal families in Europe today. If Edith's bones tell a royal love story, the skeleton of one young man from Bamborough encapsulates the violence of the Anglo-Saxon years and bears witness to his untimely death. This is his left arm, it's part of his left shoulder. <gasps> you can see that this has been sliced away across the top of the shoulder. And this is something which has happened in life rather than something which has happened to the yeah, bones in the ground? definitely. You can see if I put the rest of the shoulder together there, that we've got another piece of bone which has been sliced away. So this has happened while well, these two bones are actually still together as a joint. Yeah. Something has sliced through them. Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's been a cut across his shoulder there. And you can see here on the pelvis, a great big slice of bone has been completely cut away. Oh my goodness, yeah. Yeah. It cleaved right across. It has. So that's sliced away the front of the pelvis quite cleanly. Mm. And all the way down to his left knee. Really? Down here. Again, sliced off right on the left-hand side. A really clean slice. So it's again taken off the side of his knee. 
And this is sliced down the entire left side of his body. Yeah, it's really exciting because it gives us the possibility of even reconstructing how he was standing when the blow was struck. So because of the way that his shoulder is cut, we can tell that his arm must have been slightly forwards and across his body. Yeah. So he's probably standing in a defensive pose. Yeah. So he's actually involved in, in the fight which happened, which, which led to the end. And of his it's death. left side, which makes sense if you've got a right-handed right. aggressor. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and potentially somebody who's coming from a little bit above him as well. Do you think that he might have been a warrior? It is possible, even though he's quite small. We know that um, men in the Anglo-Saxon period started their careers quite early, so we have evidence for boys as young as seven being sent to monasteries to train as monks. And uh, we know that uh, the elite started training with weapons from quite a young age as well. So from maybe around seven or eight, he might have started learning how to use weapons. So this is a young man who had a very tough, physically demanding, but very short life. By looking at skeletons like these, we can tell so much more about past societies. And new technologies are allowing us to get at evidence that's locked away inside their bones and teeth about diet or even where they grew up. But when you look at the bones laid out like that, the skeleton of that young man, for instance, who died with that horrific injury, you realise there are also much more personal stories to be told. The warrior kings of Northumbria ruled Bambra at sword point for hundreds of years. And they left us one final reminder of their turbulent times, almost unrecognisable now, these swords are the ultimate symbols of Anglo-Saxon power. These are quite magnificent items, aren't they? They're both, I mean, obviously they're, they're corroded now, but when we x-ray them, we can see the deep structure and they're pattern welded, uh, which means that they're, they're made out of a series of, of rods um, welded together with a blade added to the outside. This one is particularly fine. You can see that it actually survives. There's a lot of metal in it. It's very strong, very coherent. This has six billets in the core of the blade. So this would have been a high-status sword? Oh, definitely. I mean, six-stranded swords are very, very rare. There are very few in Western Europe. So the likelihood is that we're looking at something that may even be more than just a, a, an aristocratic warrior. This may have been a, genuinely an heirloom of the royal house. It may have been carried by kings. And looking at this, this sword, I can't help but remember back to the skeleton from the cemetery here who was obviously a young man who died at the hands of somebody wielding a weapon just like this. The royal swords, and indeed the entire site of Bambra, are fitting symbols for the whole of Anglo-Saxon Britain. There are still so many unanswered questions and the mysteries will remain a challenge for archaeologists and historians to unlock for many years to come. But it does offer us tangible connections too. So what have I learned? Well, in many ways, these people were just like us. They had holes in their teeth, some were healthy, others marked by disease and cared for by their communities. But this was a time of great unrest and violence. Weapons became symbols of status and people died by the sword. The struggle for power played out across all levels of society and even the dead were co-opted, buried with treasures of gold and precious stones whose real value seemed to be as badges of identity. These people may not have left us detailed records of their lives, but archaeology is bringing them within our reach, and the digging goes on. <laughs> <laughs>